Ahoy there, fellow travelers. Welcome to E-Travels with E-Trules, a personal and literary podcast of travel adventures and misadventures from around the world. This is Eric Trules, and thanks for listening. This trip is a beat poetry travel adventure up the mighty Mekong River from northern Thailand to Luang Prabang in southern Laos. A three-day trip on a tin roof, laconic slow boat where I'm the only passenger on the roof in a torrential rainstorm. I first traveled to Southeast Asia at the turn of the 21st century, the year 2000 to be exact. I went with my friend El Mario, a great traveler in his own right, and we landed in Bangkok, my first trip into the Asiatic void. We got a discount ticket right here in Los Angeles, in Thai Town on Sunset, and we booked a hotel for one night only, the night of our arrival. That's the only accommodation I'll make to travel, a comfortable hotel after a long international flight leaving the rest of the trip open to improvisation, instinct, and adventure. What I remember most about our arrival on the other side of the planet was the heat. It was really hot, humid, and intense. Nothing like California's desert heat. Even at 89 degrees Fahrenheit, just about 32 degrees Celsius, it was unbearable, at least to me who wasn't used to Southeast Asia's climate. I remember sweating all day long, searching desperately for internet shops with aircon, which were few and far between, and taking three or four showers a day. The best part of my sudden Asiatic immersion was swimming alone in the hotel's pool at three in the morning, naked and delicious. But after about five days in overcrowded Bangkok, El Mario and I got Cambodian visas right from one of the backpacker shops on Koh San Road, and we booked a trip to Siem Reap, Cambodia, to see the 12th century Hindu and Buddhist temples at Angkor Wat. Going there was El Mario's main reason for our trip. Me? I had never even heard of the famous temples before. But getting there was one hell of a trip that I'll never forget. There was no tourist-friendly way to do it back in the day. So we were crammed into an old Kim's tour van, along with about 12 other backpackers in various states of cleanliness. And we had to cross the Thai-Cambodian border on foot, like a horde of colorful and undocumented immigrants from a D.W. Griffith movie, Hollywood style from the 1920s. And that was the easy part, because then, for the next 10 hours, we bumped over unpaved rural dirt roads, sometimes held together with chicken wire. And every now and then, we heard gunshots from the still warring Khmer Rouge out in the countryside. Hey, I thought those guys stopped fighting after the Vietnam War, which, of course, in Vietnam, they call the American War. But no, they didn't. In fact, we have to pull off the road altogether to let a ragged medic truck through with a bleeding shot soldier on it. As I said, Cambodia was not tourist friendly in 2000. And this trip to Siem Reap from Bangkok was definitely off. In fact, Siem Reap was the wild east back then. Backpackers being the only Western pioneers to make it to the still untamed and unrestored temples of Angkor Wat. They were whorehouses, discos, drugs, and cheap B&Bs sprawled out like little green palm thatch monopoly houses everywhere you turned. No cushy Hyatts or Hiltons in those days. I would stay out until four in the morning, walking the streets wild-eyed, while El Mario took his heart meds and tucked himself in early, wisely keeping himself out of harm's way that was everywhere in that town. That's about all I'll say about that. 
But after that wild and woolly visit, we took another backpacker cram motorboat across the Tonway Sap Lake from Seam Reef to Phnom Penh in a thunderstorm. I sat on the roof with a red towel foolishly tied around my head, thinking I was Marty Sheen in a Francis Ford Coppola movie. I got soaked, but it was beautiful. One of my favorite and most memorable boat rides ever. Next, El Mario and I went from the capital of Cambodia to the capital of South Vietnam, Saigon, now called Ho Chi Minh City. It still had the glamour and class of French provincial times, both in architecture and in wonderfully cooked food. But it, too, had its rough edges. Like when I took a foot-pedaled tuk-tuk, and instead of taking me into the center of the city for my little hotel, the cowboy driver peddled me out of the city, where he first tried to score me a variety of women for hire. But when I refused, the next thing I knew, we were suddenly stopped by a so-called policeman who planted a marijuana roach in the tuk-tuk and then tried to have me hauled off into a police station. What the hell are you doing? I screamed, scaring both the tuk-tuk driver and the so-called policeman. You're not taking me anywhere. I know, I know, when you're in Saigon, you're supposed to do what they say in Saigon. But just picturing myself in a Vietnamese prison like Brad Davis in Midnight Express, even though that was Turkey, I just lost it. Or maybe it was survival bravado. Whatever it was, it wasn't working. I was on my way to a Saigon police station at 2 in the morning and a Vietnamese prison for years until I magically produced... $100 for my underwear in U.S. cash and paid my way out of a very scary situation. Mr. Tuk Tuk took me back to my hotel as I counted another of my nine cat lives gone and I lived to tell the tale. El Mario and I went our separate ways after Saigon, mostly because he had to get back home to L.A. while I still had another six weeks left of Asiatic adventure. While Mario headed north to Hanoi, I headed inland to Dalat, into Vietnam's much cooler Central Highlands. There I hired a guide to drive me on the back of his motorbike for five days, where I discovered two things. One, Red Bull, for the first time. You know the caffeinated energy drink? Well, I was really tired by this point in my trip. Not sleeping much, eating irregularly, basically subsisting like a 53-year-old backpacker. In fact, I was so tired that I was half falling off the back of Mr. Duke's motorbike on every turn. Mr. Duke, my guide, could feel it as my grip around his waist would release with every motorized nod of my head. I don't know who was more worried, though, me or Mr. Duke. But hey, Red Bull Man <laughs> worked like a charm. Let's see those silkworm farms, Mr. Duke. Burned out Agent Orange fields? Let's go, man. And that's the second thing I learned. The effect that the American war had on Vietnam. I crawled through tiny tunnels that the Vietnamese built to not only hide and live in for years themselves, but also to spike huge, awkward American soldiers who stumbled into the tunnels at the risk of their own capture and death. I saw swaths of countryside still scarred by American bombing from the 60s and 70s. I went to the War Remnants Museum in Saigon and to Ho Chi Minh's home in Hanoi. And I listened to Mr. Duke tell me about the rehabilitation camps that he and his fellow South Vietnamese soldiers were forced to endure after the war officially ended. I saw ragamuffin ex-American soldiers still living all over Vietnam, some with post-traumatic stress disorder, some married to Vietnamese women with multiple children, most just by themselves, spaced-out victims and survivors of the costliest and longest war in American history. Until, of course, the wars we have these days in Iraq and Afghanistan. But okay. Back to the beat poetry of the podcast. I think you've listened long enough to my intro. Here you go. It's short but beat. Imagine 
setting out on the mighty Mekong River on a tin roof slow boat long after apocalypse now. Kurtz has gone mad. Now it's just me and the flow of the river. E travels with E truels. The mighty Mekong. June seventeenth, two thousand. Chang Kong, Thailand. Ahoy, land lovers! I said. Ahoy! I'm back. I know. I know. You didn't even know I was friggin' gone. But hell. I've been on the slow boat, not to China, but to Thailand, mateys, and Lao. That's what they call Laos here. Lao, as in wow. I've been up the mighty Mekong for the last two days. Long, long, beautiful Tom Sawyer apocalypse now. Days on the mighty, muddy, mellifluous Mekong. You should have seen the boat, mateys. A blue clapboard, Lao, as in wow. Flat top, tin roof, diesel puffing, tug ferry dinosaur, huffing and puffing her way up the mighty Mekong, as opposed to down the mighty Mekong. That is against the flow, mateys, as opposed to with the flow. Sounds just like me. Hey. Anyway, she was a beaut, and although they tried to keep me off the tin roof, it was just not possible. I mean, what are you supposed to do? Just sit there on the tiny hard wooden benches with the hoi polloi for forty-eight hours straight, while the sun and the rain and the river are shining and pouring and rushing by? No, ah,、uh-uh, ah, not me, mateys. I was. Bly, Kurtz, Conrad—the only passenger really into the river, watching it swirl and change currents every few kinetic and frenetically alive nanoseconds. The simply clad Lao, as in Wow, peasant captain, come on daring the ship like Chris Columbus or Ferdy Magellan, any one of those mighty river conquistadoring, syphilis-spreading Spanish sea pilots. But this guy, our guy, had the touch, had the diesel monster humming along in sonorous symphonic perfection, yet never loud enough to drown out the pervasive and even more sonorous cricket, 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 jungle rhapsody coming over the transom in four-part harmony from the mucho verdant shores of the surrounding jungle. Tall green shoreline grasses, banana, coconut frond leaf palms, hardwood teaks, rattans and bamboos, cicadas, gibbons, monkeys, monitor lizards, million more other species. I wish I had the pleasure of acquaintance. All busting a rhyme, singing sexy solos and careening collaborative choruses from the million-eyed insect. Jungle, wow, as in wow, orchestra. Wet, pregnant rain clouds hovering over, then enveloping soft green mountain tops like tender lovers. The peaks bursting the soft gray sky into torrential downpourings of monsoon madness, bombarding the tin roof like machine gun fire or McCoy Tynan on the jazz piano keys. Me not knowing which metaphor to follow, the Marty Sheen dead eye soldier of paradise lost up the river, looking for apocalyptic dead or eyed but far crazier cave dwelling Brando Kurtz metaphor, or the Tom Sawyer Huck Finn mighty Mississippi metaphor, Joni Mitchell on I'm a free man in Paris, I'm happy and alive doesn't matter, does it, matey? 
because all my fellow international passengers, German, Swiss, French, Swedish, Greek, are all buried in their guidebooks, their travel novellas, trying so nonchalantly to avoid the boredom of the long, sonambulant river days. Me, I'm just riding the wave, the ripples of the muddy Mekong, feeling separate and alone, one of the flotsam and jetsam broken off tree logs swirling hither and thither. No keel to my course, just at the omnipotent beck and call of the river. Until three days later, I'm out of Lao, as in wow. I'm back in better taste in Thailand, cruising along the mighty Mekong, but this time... I'm landlocked on my rented 100cc mini motorbike, chewing on hard, stringy sugar cane, leaning into the winding Thai roads, open full throttle, off to the poppy field, hill country tomorrow of the Golden Triangle, Burma, Lao, Thailand, where they grow the secret, sweet, brown-eyed poppies. Hope to try something I haven't ever tried before. All right, got it? Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Here's hoping the grass is growing green through your weeds. Love, Mekong Marlin. Original music composed by Amanda Yamate. Sound designed by Ethan Zeitman. Produced by Harry Duran at Fullcast. This podcast has been supported with the USC Capstone Grant. Special thanks to Phil Allen and the School of Dramatic Arts for their support.